A Stanford and Harvard-trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist who uses ketamine in the operating room like this one and outside the operating room for many different reasons to help patients tap into their inner healing potentials, whether it's in surgery or outside of the operating room. And today, we're going to talk about what ketamine is because it's far more than just a horse tranquilizer and how it can help patients heal themselves and the differences when it's used in an operating room versus in a ketamine clinic. Two totally different applications of ketamine, both can be life-saving. But let's first start off by saying that ketamine has been used in anesthesia in surgery since the 1960s and 70s. It's used in kids, it's used in adults, at low doses, at medium doses and high doses because it can help make us unconscious. Now, this is very different than a ketamine clinic where the goal of the ketamine is not to make somebody unconscious. But first, let me show you what happens when ketamine is used at the high doses and why you always want to have a doctor who's trained at using ketamine at low and high doses so that if you're in a ketamine clinic, they can manage any side effects that might happen. Now, I see Terry's on here. Um, and she had a bad experience with ketamine in an ER. We'll talk about why that happens. Because that's a very, very important consideration when patients are looking for ketamine clinics and how different it is in a ketamine clinic that's run correctly. And I'm going to tell you what to look for versus when used in the ER or the operating room. Sheila, good to see you. Hey, let's talk about it. Good to see you. I'm sending you the best for your ketamine experience tomorrow and I'm so happy to hear how effective it's been for you, and I am Devil Woman, good to see you. So this is an operating room, here's a ventilator. That's the back. <laughs> when you're having ketamine at high doses, you should only be doing this with an anesthesiologist or an emergency room doctor. Now, you need to have many different medications and tools available to safely manage what's going on. So this is an example of the many medications to manage blood pressure, by the way, a lot of these come from the natural world. We don't talk about it, but they actually came from plants. This one's ephedrine, for example. We also have atropine. They're also from a plant and also life-saving. Uh, another really important one you always need to have around is called epinephrine. That's this little guy here. This one vial can save a life. Now, it's pretty rare to have to use this in a ketamine clinic or in the operating room when you're using ketamine, but you always need to have the emergency medications immediately available. One of the more common ones that we'll actually use here is called Zofran. It's for nausea, whether in the operating room or from ketamine in a clinic. So you need these in an OR because when you're not breathing from those high doses of ketamine, we need to support all of your body's normal functions like its heart rate, its blood pressure, etc. We also need breathing tubes, let's see. These are some of the breathing tubes we use. These are called LMAs. You've seen many videos of where I almost put it all the way in the back of my mouth. It kind of, if you're awake, will cause a gag reflex. So I don't put it in there all the way when I show you, but you get the idea. And then there is the endotracheal tubes as well. You've seen me show these in plenty of other videos. These go in the back of the mouth. And of course, you've actually seen videos of me intubating as well. Then up here, as you know, are the laryngoscopes. To all, this goes in your mouth. And we have to place this in your mouth to help support. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have to place that metal in your mouth to place that breathing tube. Now, that's only for ketamine at high doses. But even when you're having, hey, Savannah, good to see you. When you get ketamine in a ketamine clinic, there is an opportunity, there's a chance always of the dose being too high, especially if it's intramuscular or if it's IV. No matter how safe everyone is, yeah, also, you always need to have the backup equipment. You always need to have a doctor who knows how to manage ketamine in those settings if the dose is too high, especially, and this is what you all need to know, if you have high blood pressure, if you have kidney problems, if you have multiple other medical conditions, if you're on multiple medications for anxiety or depression or PTSD or OCD or any other number of conditions, the ketamine doses need to be adjusted so much 
there's always theoretically a chance that the dose might get too high, so you need to have all that backup equipment I showed you, even if it's not being used for general anesthesia. Because when you're adjusting doses, you always have to be prepared. Um, OG is asking, can somebody pee under general anesthesia? Uh, all right, a little bit of a digression, but since you asked, this is an OR table. Yes, you can pee. That's true. Um, it's pretty rare, but it can happen. In a ketamine clinic, very, very, very rare, because if someone has to pee, we escort them to the bathroom. Thank you for bringing that up. It's actually a good point. <laughs> so in the operating room, you're getting middle doses to high doses of ketamine. In a ketamine clinic, you're getting low doses to middle doses. I always take the same precautions because safety is first for a ketamine infusion. In my clinic in San Francisco, we only do ketamine infusions because ketamine infusions are the fastest way to getting ketamine to your brain. It's why in the operating room, we don't do intramuscular ketamine, we don't do oral ketamine, we don't do intranasal ketamine, we give it IV because we need it to act fast for the surgery here to safely happen. In my ketamine clinic, we also use IV because it gets results fast. It crosses the blood-brain barrier within seconds and we do it safely because what you should always look for, what you should always look for is an anesthesiologist or an ER doctor because they know how to manage ketamine at low and middle doses. And they can manage any side effects that might happen. And on top of that, you want to find a doctor who has extra training specifically in how to use psychedelic medicine. So I personally, as you know, did a fellowship in integrative medicine and have done a ton of training specifically with psychedelics to guide patients, not only in the operating room when that opportunity arises in the right patient, for the right surgery, with the right anesthesia, but also outside the operating room when we can use psychedelics and ketamine in safe, supervised manners to overcome these challenging treatment-resistant conditions. So it's two types of training, both in the critical care medicine that I showed you and in that mind-body medicine. You can call it spirituality, a spiritual medicine. It can be secular, it can be religious, depends on the patient. But that experience needs to be, when you're looking with doctors that are board certified and trained in this, in an environment that has those right tools, but, and please, please pay attention to this, in an operating room or an ER, this is the right setting. It's medical, it looks all sterile. In my ketamine clinic, it is absolutely not like this. This set and setting has a profound, and I can't stress this enough, profound impact on where the ketamine will take you. So when you're in this area here, the ketamine can be done safely and it will take you to a safe place for your surgery. Not necessarily a healing place for the monsters, for a troubling past, for rumination and perseveration of anxiety or depression. The set and setting of your clinic cannot and should not be a medical clinic like this. It needs to be a space where you, and please listen carefully, you feel trusting and comfortable and feel that you can connect with the environment that you're in with the doctor who's there guiding you, keeping you safe. It's not supposed to be a surgery environment or emergency room with monitors beeping. Of course, all of that is happening in the background. I. I call it a spiritual ICU, all right, because I'm monitoring everything carefully in the patient, but that's not the patient's experience. That's my job. It's not the patient's job to be hearing the beeping and all of the, the blood pressure cuff going up and down, etc. That's all very important, but the scenery, the setting, the mindset will determine where you go in that ketamine journey. And if it's a medical place like this, gosh, that might raise medical PTSD. It might encourage being inward and being afraid to address those deep things that can and at the right time should come up so that we can address the root cause of pain and suffering. So I, that's just a handful of the things to look for so that, you know, there's a lot of ketamine clinics. A lot of them are not run correctly, are not run safely, are money grabs and are not 
doing the right thing for patients who are truly struggling and are vulnerable. And I don't want you to fall in that trap. So let's catch up with the questions that have come in because there's so many good questions here. Um, all right, Gerald says, I just had a hemicolectomy. Gerald, I hope everyone here can send you positive vibes as you recover from your hemicolectomy. Brian, um, you made such a powerful observation. Brian says, when you stop fighting anxiety and give up, it feels much better. So it's not about giving up and failure, but this is actually the premise of a ketamine experience or anesthesia. When you're on this table or in a clinic, like what I'm describing to you in my clinic, when we can surrender to the experience that the ketamine is taking us, I don't actually have ketamine here, but I have propofol, which is very similar in some, but not always, to ketamine. When we can surrender to the experience and trust the set and setting, trust our doctors who are taking care of us and guiding us, your surgeon, your anesthesiologist in this case, or your doctor, your guide, your therapist in my ketamine infusion clinic, when we can surrender and let go and not fight, we can just resolve so much of the friction that is making us sick in the first place, mentally, physically, and of course, since they're both connected, both of them. Very, very good observation, Brian. Um, ZA is going to OHS next month for ketamine. Well, advice for you is everything that I'm telling you about right now, what to look out for, and you can always go to my website to read up on my, all my articles on how to get the most out of your ketamine experience. Darian, good to see you. Sophia, good to see you. Uh, <laughs> I am Devil Woman. Happy to hear about all that snowfall. Hope you're staying safe. Jessica Films, very good to see you. Intranasal ketamine helped her significantly with her anxiety, but developed a side effect of a bladder problem and had to discontinue it. Jessica, it's not uncommon. This is really, really good that you brought this up. Side effects of ketamine, what we said in the operating room, involve not breathing, blood pressure changes, heart rhythm changes, and that's why I showed you all these medications here that we have to be able to immediately treat these, right? All sorts of medications for the heart, uh, for nausea, etc. In a ketamine clinic, the doses are much lower, but they might be used for more longer periods of time. And that's why we need to always check in to make sure that you don't have kidney problems that might predispose to those side effects and change the dose if needed. Unfortunately, for intranasal, for lozenges, we don't have as much flexibility as we have for intravenous ketamine. That's why if you have access to an anesthesiologist who's trained or an ER doc who knows how to use intravenous ketamine, you have so much more flexibility in dosing to hopefully minimize the chance of the side effects. Uh, Jody, great to see you from England. And uh, unbox it with Maureen. Well, hopefully one day, if you can't make it out here, you can find, uh, you can find a way to attain that same state where you are. Um, Jody, if I had a patient with autism, how would I deal with them? Depends. Do you mean in the operating room <laughs> or in what clinical context? Because it's very context specific. Uh, Brian says, I have a budget set aside for making an appointment. <laughs> okay. Very good, very good. I, I hope that we can help you. Jennifer, what about ketamine and CKD? I was just diagnosed. So you cannot use ketamine the same way if you have kidney problems as you do without kidney problems. That's why you need to have a doctor who knows how to interpret the blood test. I always ask for a basic metabolic panel in patients at risk to look at their glomerular filtration rate, their EGFR, then I change the dose according to that. Very good question. It's not an absolute contraindication, but we need to take it into account. I sometimes ask for those blood tests before and during. And Noura Alfari is a first year medical student. I'm struggling. How can I make it more fun? Noura, you always have to search in your heart of hearts to make sure you want to do medicine. Too many of us go into medicine not really knowing what it is. Without knowing more about you, I can't give you advice, but I can say that in your heart of hearts, if you want to do medicine, revisit on a regular basis why you want to do medicine to re-spark that kindling within you. I got so burned out and so disenchanted for so many years until I discovered the mind-body potential in the operating room and with ketamine, and it's really reinvigorated my passion for medicine and helping others. There is always hope. 
So Sheila says, have you used ketamine for chronic fatigue long COVID? No, I have not. Is it potentially beneficial? Depends on if there are other root causes to that CFS or to the long COVID. There are other ways of addressing those, but ketamine in and of itself is unlikely to be a silver bullet. However, is worth this worth exploring with a doctor that you trust to see if there might be benefits that outweigh the risks. Uh, okay, so Jody had asked earlier about autism. This is challenging, Jody, because neurodivergent conditions, autism included, are not candidates for ketamine. In the anesthesia space, in the operating room, they, this can be challenging because if the individual, if the patient doesn't know what to expect, it's difficult to prepare for surgery. You come in a room like this, and it can be scary. There are these big bright lights. They're off right now, but they get very bright when we turn them on. The bed is comfortable, but it's not super comfortable. There's unfamiliar people, funny medications. The most important thing for somebody with autism before the operating room is to take the time for them to know who is in the room with them. Unfamiliar faces are jarring for all of us, especially anyone with autism. Without that trust in place, the experience is never as smooth. The chances of post-operative delirium, of waking up angry with a bad outcome, etc., are all increased. Now, we can give sedatives to just chill people out, but that's putting a band-aid over the underlying cause. And I don't believe that it is as effective as addressing the root cause of distrust, of unfamiliarity, of knowing what to expect. It unfortunately takes more time. In children in particular with autism, it's not easy to try to have them know who's in the room with them for that they build that trust. But when it's there, it is probably the most powerful and safest way to proceed with elective surgery. Just sedating people, like the whole horse tranquilizer thing I was saying, doesn't build trust in the system because you might get through the first surgery, but boy, will you have, should a future surgery be needed, you're gonna have an uphill battle to overcome potential PTSD that comes up from that first episode. I hope that makes sense, Jody. Um, Anna says, have I used ketamine in patients with hypertension in laparoscopic surgeries? Yes, I have. Fair says, I worked as a nurse for six years. Oh, hi, thank you so much for the kind comments, Fair. Thank you for your service to patients. Darian says, is there anything I can do in anesthesia beside donate? You can always, um, <laughs> you can always shadow anesthesiologists in an operating room to see what they do. It might be really fun and educational for you. And Darian, maybe you can be a patient advocate to help explain to patients what to expect in these otherwise scary situations. It can be really gratifying when you can help someone through that scary situation, even if you're not an anesthesiologist, by helping prepare them mentally, physically, and together for a good outcome. Great question, Darian. Um, can an anesthesiologist open a clinic or become a physician? Yes, that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I've done in my, uh, in my ketamine infusion clinic, a holistic, I should say, ketamine infusion clinic. Um, all right, love the educational videos. Thank you so much, Mflo, for the kind comments. And Nura says, I'm actually enjoying, but I get bad marks on every single block. Well, Nura, when, not knowing specifically what those tests are that you're talking about, I will say that going back, in medical school, I lost sight of the forest by looking at the trees, and I wish I had somebody to help zoom me out to look at, in especially the pathophysiology sections, what is it that we're trying to treat? What is the bigger context this falls within? That's the art of medicine, to know how small details should not get lost in a forest, but be integrated with the greater picture of healing. I hope that makes sense. Uh, yeah, Jody, thank you for the kind comments. All right, Iron A and Fair, we're gonna deal, we're gonna answer your two questions last before I have to go. Would this help for people who get extremely nauseous after anesthesia? Iron A, I don't think I've seen you before, so it's good to see you. But what would be uh, helpful, are you saying, for nausea? There's many treatments, natural and synthetic. You tell me which one you're referring to. Fair says, how do you deal with burnout? I left nursing because of it. Fair, 
I commiserate with you, burnout is a huge thing in medicine because of politics, because of not having control over how we treat patients, over not having access to the right medications, over having patients who feel so disempowered that they end up hurting themselves in ways that we can't help them. And perhaps nothing hurts more than to have a patient that you can't help who desperately needs help. That's why I have started my own clinic because I find so much more fulfillment in being able to dictate how I practice medicine. That's not available to everyone. So everyone just had to find in their own heart of hearts how they can help patients on terms that they believe are in line with their healing principles. I hope that makes sense fair. Um, hey, peace, good to see you. Um, while I'm waiting for Iron A's uh, clarification, let me just mention to you, ketamine is useful, I say, for anyone who has a mental or physical health condition that is based on cognitive rigidity. We'll have to talk about what cognitive rigidity is in a future video, but depression, anxiety, PTSD can all potentially be very amenable to ketamine treatments. Acute suicidality is very amenable to treatment, but you need to go to the right clinic. And if you came into the end, you should watch at the beginning where I talk about how ketamine in the OR is different than ketamine in a properly healing space uh, that, a ketamine, that my ketamine infusion clinic is set up in. Now, Iron A, let's answer your question. Maybe it's not specific to ketamine, she says, but after anesthesia, I get extremely nauseous. What can help? Nausea comes from three things. Our mindset, anesthesia medications, and pain around the time of surgery. So nerve blocks, epidural, spinals are all powerful ways to reduce general anesthesia, which can increase nausea. Propofol is powerful for an anti-nausea effect compared to the anesthesia gases that come out of the ventilator here, like this yellow one, sevoflurane, and mindset. So anxiety can worsen nausea. Feeling uh, that your pain is not being addressed, and maybe it's not being addressed, that can increase nausea. So that, ha that has to be, you can't be in pain and be trying to only treat nausea. You gotta treat the pain first because pain in and of itself increases our nausea. So I have a couple of videos on that. You should check those out where I talk specifically about the framework, but uh, ketamine in and of itself can be nauseating, not as nauseating as the gases, but is not in and of itself a treatment for nausea. Can extreme pain in general also cause nausea? Sophia, yes, it can. You're right. Absolutely. All right, peace. I'm really happy you asked your question about ketamine um, and the number of sessions. We'll talk about all that in another video that's coming up. Um, but they're all very important questions. For now, though, I hope you know what to look for in a ketamine clinic. <laughs> that was my ringtone. If you want to find healing, because there's many scammy clinics out there, like any industry, and I want you to know how you can find the best healing experience for yourself to be empowered with that knowledge. Until then, remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. And if you enjoyed what I shared, if you could hit the like button and share what you learned with others, I'd really appreciate it. Take care.